I've been asking myself over the past few days as to what qualification I have either to address this august body here this evening or to take on such an academic subject as church and state. Perhaps the fact that my father, Michael MacDonald, around about the year 1920, was burning cotton warehouses along the docks in Liverpool, England, has left somehow or other a streak in his son, myself, which generates a less than friendly attitude to some kinds of states. My father's attitude to the state was very much similar to that of many of you listening to me here this evening. He prided his, himself on his proud possession for most of his life was the old IRA medal. None of you here would make the distinction between the old and the new IRA, <clears throat> but this was the old IRA medal he received for his part in what we call in Ireland the Troubles. And the Troubles probably are just the Irish equivalent of your struggle. A further reason why I should not be here is that when people say, as they do so often around me in my life as I get old, let's sit down and discuss the problem. I can't wait for someone to say, let's get up and do something to solve the problem. I am, according to this thing I'm wearing, which I had to look for because he insisted, Elias, that I wear this thing this evening. <laughs> a little more qualified with this to speak on the role of the church. But even here, I am a little embarrassed, given that I am speaking in the presence of the Masalela family, and especially in memory of their mother, a woman of enormous deep Christian faith, a faith that sustained her and her family and gave her and them the courage, the devotion, the loyalty, and the commitment to a cause that was just and right. There seems to be a trend among our politicians, unfortunately there are quite a few of them here this evening, to warn the church, don't meddle in politics, stick to your Bible. The church has been committed by Christ to preach the truth. When the truth is removed from the political arena and the void is filled by an inordinate hunger for power, there is, as one great writer said, an inevitable descent into what one can only call a madness. The political community and the church are mutually independent and autonomous bodies. Each in its own way serves the personal and social needs of the same human beings. The church must be allowed to preach the faith with true freedom, to teach her social doctrines, to carry out her pastoral task among people, to pass moral judgments even on matters concerning politics when fundamental human rights require it. The great son of Africa, Jomo Kenyatta, when speaking to a group of bishops in Kenya said, we need the church in Africa. We need the church in our midst to tell us what we are, when we are making mistakes. The church is the conscience of society. And today, society needs a conscience. Do not be afraid to speak. If we go wrong and you keep quiet, one day you may have to answer for our mistakes. The bishops in Africa recently proclaimed, we would be betraying our mission. We would be seriously failing in our love and duty, which we owe to the people of Africa. If we are to remain silent, we condemn all crimes committed in the name of the security of the state, as if the state was absolute and not this at the service of its citizens. The Second Vatican Council, which some of you may have heard of, made the church's position in the context of Southern Africa over the years, recent years, very clear. The exercise of political authority must always be carried out 
in the framework of a moral order in pursuit of the common good when citizens are oppressed by a public authority which exceeds its competence it is allowable for them within the limits of the law of nature and the gospel to defend their rights against the abuse of authority. The moral law, guardian of human rights, cannot be set aside by the state for any cause, not even for security or in the interests of law and order. The law of God stands in judgment over reasons, all reasons of state. Those couple of paragraphs are the theory. The crunch comes in the practice, the application, the ultimate meaning of words and ideas when subjected to the weak, earthy environment of the human condition. During the years when the indignity, disrespect, and humiliation which flowed from the political system at the time degenerated into the brutalization of the citizenry Southern Africa was a confusing mixture of ideologies, economies, and religions, all controlled by an equally confusing mixture of radical, right-wing, left-wing forms of government. These forms of government equally confusingly followed an assortment of economic systems ranging from free market Western capitalism to state-controlled communism, way out on a limb was the ungodly, Bible-inspired variation of man's inhumanity to man. At this time, the church, at the level of the community, had a very distinct colonial image looming over all of its activities. It turned elsewhere, out of Africa, for financial report, for its personnel, for its theology, and for its missionary approach. The practice faith of the church did not sit too comfortably with the traditional African churches. Little effort was made to discover the God who was here before the missionaries arrived. The new form of Christian spirituality lacked the intimacy of the ancestor presence. The liturgy lacked the dynamic personal and emotional attraction of the moving, dancing, praying spirits. The church belonged more to the clerical leaders than to the traditional leaders or communities. There was generally a lack of appreciation of deeper needs of the African soul. While the theory of the Christian holistic concept of the human person was there, there was lacking a practical expression of a biblical theory of the development of this holism. While the church had a lot of real experience, of conflict situations, it seemed quite incapable of handling the revolutionary situation in which the chief antagonist, the state, was unwilling to negotiate a compromise, preferring self-destruction to any form of surrender. There was another, perhaps at a deeper level, generally unappreciated contribution from the church. The church had the ability to see the larger picture to analyze the evil, to find, see, and explain the truth by speaking up to bearing witness to injustices through its justice and peace organizations. To succeed <clears throat> those deprived of their human rights. In a word, to play the prophetic role of telling the whole world about the brutality of the system, perhaps not always shouting it from the housetops, but at least from the pulpits. The church also attacked the myth of national security, a myth which claims credence from the principle of the common good, a principle usually established by a small, powerful group who claim that they alone possess the wisdom which defines the so-called common good. This analysis of situations on the ground was often followed by establishing the necessary means of communication, which gave encouragement to small groups working alone. At the spiritual level, in the midst of human suffering and degradation, the church kept alive the most basic notions concerning the dignity of the human person in all its aspects, physical, mental, emotional, social, 
and spiritual. Finally, I would like to mention some personal reflections and memories from the struggle period. One of the greatest embarrassments of my life is my ignorance at not realizing the enormity of the horror that was going on around me. The killings along the roads, the bombs at Saikele mentioned this evening at a very important moment in one person's life. I was standing outside the house within 10 minutes of the bomb, by the way, Absalom. The spies in our midst, people at Silesia will know who they are. The repeated raiding of the Ephesus House offices where I served as a committee member for many years. My shaking hands with Craig Williamson. The Salesian Manzini Youth Care children finding the largest arms cache ever found in Swaziland, trying to sell the AK-47s to soldiers at Massandrini camp wasn't a very bright, bright idea on their part. The letter of the Anglican and Catholic bishops which eventually forced the authorities to release those held without trial after the 1977 riots. The safe houses run by our Bishop Manla Zwani trying to find Elias during his final examination week. Stan Mabazela's locked room at Silesian. I was told when I arrived there was only one key to that room. The phony telegrams to students about the death of their grandmothers. The shootout at Nguani Park. The number of our students who went abroad, some never to return. Theodore Glamini talking to the screaming students at our gates on a Wednesday morning and persuading them to come in, sit down on the lawn, and talk. At the Royal Inquiry afterwards, my main crime was providing them with a public address system to discuss their problems. I would like to conclude these few reflections with a well-known word spoken by a Catholic bishop later killed by the state. To give them a local color, I've taken the liberty of paraphrasing, paraphrasing them. Finally, I would like to mention some personal reflections and memories from the struggle period. One of the greatest embarrassments of my life is my ignorance at not realizing the enormity of the horror that was going on around me. The killings along the roads, the bombs at Saikele mentioned this evening at a very important moment in one person's life. I was standing outside the house within 10 minutes of the bomb, by the way, absolutely. <laughs> the spies in our midst, the people at Silesia will know who they are. The repeated raiding of the Ephesus House offices where I served as a committee member for many years. My shaking hands with Craig Williamson. The Salesian Manzini Youth Care children finding the largest arms cache ever found in Swaziland. Trying to sell the AK-47s to soldiers at Massandrini camp wasn't a very bright idea on their part. The letter on the Anglican and Catholic bishops which eventually forced the authorities to release those held without trial after the 1977 riots. The safe houses run by our Bishop Mandaswani, trying to find Elias during his final examination week. Stan Mabazela's locked room at Silesia. I was told when I arrived there was only one key to that room. The phony telegrams to students about the death of their grandmothers. The shootout at Nguani Park. The number of our students who went abroad, some never to return. Theodore Glamini talking to the screaming students at our gates on a Wednesday morning and persuading them to come in, sit down on the lawn and talk. At the Royal Inquiry afterwards, my main crime was providing them with a public address system to discuss their problems. I would like to conclude these few reflections with a well-known word spoken by a Catholic bishop later killed by the state. To give them a local color, I've taken the liberty of paraphrasing, paraphrasing them. When I give the people bread, 
they call me a saint. When I ask why the people have no bread, they call me 